Life Stories Live. He had yes. a business. Yes. Did he have plans for you to go into the business or anything like that? No. That's that's an inter- interesting question. Um, <laughs> um, my father cut glass, and cutting glass is not a good... Uh, tends to... You have accidents, and blood appears. So I remember my father coming home one night, I was probably quite young, and I saw his kind of... Uh, blood pouring out of his hands and things sticking out, etc. And I'm a bit of a wimp, to be honest. I don't like the sight of blood too much. So, uh, no, uh, it was a very brief discussion, I think, when I got to the age where I could have taken the business over and he realised that wasn't there. He actually was interested. He liked quite like the... Uh, uh, he, he was a very humble man. He came from uh, the East End of London. He had nothing. But he, he he worked hard and earned money. And he he, he quite enjoyed the, the stock market. He wanted me to become a stockbroker. Right. Uh, uh, and in fact, he got me a, a temporary job, I think, when I was 15 in the summer holidays to work with a, be a stockbroker's run around the city in the days where you delivered contract notes by hand and ran here and ran there. But uh, no, I didn't. He, he didn't uh, didn't really have that. I think he, he gave me freedom to do whatever I felt I wanted to do. That's pretty good. And what about your mum? How was your mum? Well, that's interesting again, isn't it? She was, uh, I say, she her original training was a bookkeeper, um, which I can now, with hindsight, see maybe that's how I got into accountancy where I didn't want to. Uh, but she, <laughs> she, as I, as I mentioned, she ran the glass business during the World War Two, and then she had her own little uh, China gift shop after that. So they, 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 they both worked hard, but uh, no. Um, I think she, the father was probably a bit easier with me than she was. She thought I should uh, do my homework and study a bit more. And uh, uh, so uh, she was probably trying to keep a bit, bit of a wiser eye on me. But my father worked very hard for long hours. So in those days, business was six days a week. And, uh, and yeah, that, that was it. One interesting thing, actually, and I only found this out after my mother died, um, was that my uh, my father, my name was obviously Robert Conway, my father was called Ernest Conway. And I was clearing out my mother's bungalow and I came across some old papers I knew nothing about. And it was a, uh, a deed that my father wrote in 1939, changing his name from Ernest Conway Levi to Ernest Conway. And of course I thought, what is this? Yeah. So at that point in time, I realized i had jewish roots and uh, conversation for another day but uh yeah so that's been interesting exploring and uh, finding out more about uh, the jewish roots etc so yeah. and was it just you did you have any siblings no i had a, a sister a sister uh who, who was an architect very successful one she designed what was terminal four at heathrow which was a kind of the leading terminal now so before terminal five but uh, uh but I, and I've shared the gospel with her, etc. But she hasn't come to faith. Um, she's not made that decision. Uh, she's read the book and said it was kind of interesting, but uh, she hasn't made that decision yet. Yet, I like that one. Always, always yet. You seem to have a panache for business because you said they wanted to uh, run gigs and things like that, and with bands mm. and things like that. How did you fare out with that? Ah, oh, I could. Uh, yeah, we. <laughs> It was great. And in fact, um, the name that people will remember would be Paul McCartney. Yep. And uh, it was my final year. Uh, it was in February 1972. And uh, I was in the uh, Students' Union. And I was responsible for the, the concerts. And we generally had them on a Friday night. But we didn't have one that night. And a guy came up and said, uh, um, I've got Paul McCartney outside. He wants to play at uh, your place tonight. I said, oh, yeah. Pull the other leg. <laughs> uh, and he said, oh, seriously, come outside. I went outside, and uh, it was when Paul McCartney had just left the Beatles and started his own group called Wings, Wings got on yeah. the road. And uh, he'd gone across to Manchester University, and they couldn't sort him out, put it on at short notice. We said we did. So agreed a deal with Paul McCartney uh, that we could get as many students in as 4 o'clock, I think, by 7 o'clock that night. We got 600 at uh, 50p a ticket, and we agreed to share it 25p for him. 25p for the student union. <laughs> what a story. <laughs> Have you met Paul McCartney since? No. <laughs> Not yet, no. Anyway, you, you finished your education. You said you managed to scrape through on a 2.2. Yes. And you got yourself a job as a, an accountant. You took the articles. 
That's uh, yeah. After I did the, uh, the the short time in the in yeah. the Presswich Corporation of Civic Hall, yes, I did my yes. articles training. That's right. I mean, some would say that's quite a boring job, having done what you've yeah. done with the bands. Yeah, yeah, I thought that as well. But actually, <laughs> I, I I realized it was more to it wasn't accountancy as such. It was actually finance and the whole of the financing and what you can do. And I I, I suppose I'm a numbers man at heart, uh, and I enjoy playing around with numbers. And uh, there was something that. That interested me, and it was, uh, yeah. Sometimes it takes a while, I think, and there's always a challenge, isn't it, to know what your gifts and talents are. Mm. It took me until I was 20, probably 23. And some people, I know there's a lovely word, the, uh, the best um, operas ever written, uh, never written, the best books never, never published, uh, the best paintings that nobody's seen were all in the graveyard. Because people that had the talents didn't use them. Mm-hmm. Would, you say, would you say that you were a slow burner then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I would. I think that's a, a fair description. Yeah, because you came. Uh, you, were you sorry you didn't get to go abroad? With your, um... I've travelled so much since uh, in, in life, and it. Yeah, and I've been. I've been greatly blessed through business uh, and personal life as well. So, um, one of the things I didn't mention was. Um, we started a, a business in Kenya. Actually, that was during, during COVID as well, in response to, because our printed circuit boards go into a lot of medical devices, ventilators, et cetera. And uh, we were asked if we could help on an emergency basis for the production line. So we air freighted a production line down to Kenya in uh, May last year uh, to produce printed circuit boards. And Kenya's been a place that we visited, love, got a real heart for East Africa. Uh, we've helped businesses in Tanzania and other places as well. So no, I've I've been very very fortunate to travel. Well, during this time, of co- during this time, of course, you managed to meet and marry your wife. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your wife and what her name is. Ah, her name is Sue. Sue, Sue Susan Mary. Uh, she's of Irish. There we are. Dual Irish there you go. origin. <laughs> Miss Miss uh, When she was a nurse, um, I think she was told by a matron um, you to be called by your surname. Oh, uh, so call yourself Kelly. She said, "No, no, my name is Miss Kelly, M I S, Kelly." And uh, and the matron thought, "No, she was calling herself Miss Kelly." So anyway, that's a bit about her. So and and Sue actually didn't want to marry me. She wanted to go and help the poor in Africa uh, as a nurse. And uh, isn't it amazing how kind of whatever it is, thirty, forty years later, we've been able to go and help in Africa when we couldn't, you know, in our in our early twenties. Excellent. Of course, 1986 was a very uh, big good year for you for, uh, for the partnership. Also found out that your wife had ME. 
Yeah, did, that, yeah, that came a couple of years after. That was yeah. in the early 90s, yeah. How did yeah. you feel when you found this out? I couldn't cope with it. It was, it was, I have to say, and this is a hypocrite, I had a secretary that worked for us in the office a couple of years before that, and she was always off sick. And to be honest, I thought she was a leg swinger. I thought, yeah, <laughs> I, that's what a bad person, you know, I was. I'm not saying I'm a good person now, but God refined you. And uh, it, it, was all, it was a slap in the face almost that actually this, this is a serious disease. You can't see it. It's not a broken leg. Um, mm -hmm. It's not, you know, those kind of things. But you can't do anything. And it was, I couldn't cope with it. As I said, I was not only a workaholic, I became an alcoholic at that point in time. And how, um, how did that affect your relationship and the family? Oh, it, it could, have, could have fallen apart. It really could have fallen apart. I think what God did was... A, 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 not only a saving point in terms of my life, I think it probably saved my marriage at that point in time. It was a, very much a turning point. Indeed, because uh, was it 1994 you said you went to a meeting and your wife got um, healed? Yes, yes. This was, your first, this was your first experience of, uh, say, Christian yes. singing, dancing? Yes, oh. yes. Yeah, it was all... How did it compare get, to putting Paul McCartney on? <laughs> How yeah. did it compare to that kind of music? How did it compare? Well, it was it was very pleasant music. You know, there were modern songs, well played, etc. It was the kind of, to me, not coming from a church background, not seeing praise and worship as it was. I didn't understand why people were waving their arms in the air, doing things like that. It just seemed it didn't. It made no sense to me. Uh, as a as a non-believer at that point in time, it, it, in in fact, as I said, when they they did the offering, I, as naively said, they're just after your money. You know, I was just so wrong. <laughs> now, you know, and now, <laughs> given what God's given me to do, you know, he's, he's just turned the thing the other way. And speaking of money, did you make a lot of money actually working as an accountant for uh, Price Waterhouse yes, Coopers? Yes, yes, I, I, I obviously it was on a profit share. We were very successful. I was I was well looked after. Excellent. Yeah, so so when I I could have carried on and made hundreds of thousands of pounds, but God called me to step out when He did. At fifty four, I could have carried on till I was sixty, but uh, I knew that when the calling came, it was time to step out in faith. Now, of course, at that time you also mentioned dark boardrooms. Can you explain mm. a little bit of what you mean by dark boardrooms? Yeah, um, City of London. Are we um, talking um, cloak and dagger here, or well? Um, I, I may be getting onto a controversial topic, but you, you're taking me there, so I'm going to deal with it. Freemasonry in the city of London is is rife. Okay. Um, you know, to become mayor of London, you have to be a Freemason. Twenty eight aldermen of London are Freemasons, uh, and Freemasonry is from the forces of darkness. And we know in the higher echelons of many, not all, but many companies, um, Freemasonry um, is is rife. And the forces of darkness are right. And the, the, the battle, the, there is a battle going on between darkness and light. We know that Jesus is light of the world. But Mammon and Satan uh, are, are using money and greed to try and bring uh, the forces of darkness to against the, the world of light. Mm -hmm. That's why the challenge in the marketplace and working in the marketplace is a very simple one. We are in a spiritual battle every day. We declare Ephesians 6, put on the armour of God. But there are many examples where I've been accused of money laundering, uh, of corruption, of bribery, all things I haven't done. Uh, told you we were in a seven-year battle in court uh, against the company. It's been a, a long and continues to be a spiritual battle. But that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's if you're serving Jesus, you've got to be prepared for that. And now thank you, you for brothers like you and prayer partners that make all the difference. Now, you said when you first went to the meeting, you said you, you, your wife was um, filled with the Holy Spirit and you got filled with the Holy Spirit as well. Not, not that day. Not no, that day. I, knew, I knew there was a God mm -hmm. and I knew I had to find out more. And then we went to the local church where our friends took us. And I went to that meeting of the churches together in the town a couple of months later. That's when I, I gave my life to Christ. And I received the Holy Spirit. What was the experience like? Was there bells and whistles or was it just nice and quiet? Uh, 
it was very peaceful. I felt um, almost like a release, um, a weight was lifted. I felt, yeah, a newness. You know, I know the word born again sometimes gets misinterpreted and people look at that in different ways, but it was a, a new start. I felt something was new, something was different. There was uh, some new things to do, which is why I had the immediate reaction of, I should stop work tomorrow and go help the poor and needy immediately. You know, the Christian call. I would have been a terrible missionary. I told you I don't <laughs> like it, the sight of blood even. I would have been hopeless. But actually, God had a better plan. And obviously, Pat Kellard and what I shared helped me to see the call in the marketplace and help different people in different ways to do that. So, so you, you were 43. You were yep. in a very powerful job, earning lots of money. Yeah. All of a sudden, your life changed. You became a Christian. Yeah. How did that affect your job in the corridors of power? Yeah. Interesting. I shared with uh, my partners um, because I can tell you when we have partners meetings, etc., on a Monday morning, yeah, there was the language wasn't always good in the room. I used to swear. I stopped swearing, and actually, I took offence if other people did. I didn't uh, didn't cause a stir, but people knew that there was something different in Robert, etc. Um, and they they thought I had gone a little bit crazy. I think they they tolerated me. But actually, business was great. We continued to do excellent business, making good good money. So my my I think my partners tolerated me during that season because I was helping them make money. And did you come across any, um, shall we say, situations where you had to make a decision whether it would be a Christian or not? If you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. Um, one of the challenges was I, I was asked to uh, help advise and sell a company called Demon Internet. Okay. <laughs> you don't get much darker than that, do you? Oh, New no. internet, in, internet service provider. And I really didn't feel very comfortable about that. Um, but it was an existing client of the firm. And um, we, we, we had to honour it. But I, I was most, and in fact, I put one of the things in the, I don't have many regrets in life, but that was one regret that I didn't turn that down. Um, since then, we've seen other things in our businesses, et cetera, examples of um, we have zero tolerance and bribery and corruption. Company, when we took TAH over, uh, I went through the books and we found out that we'd been paid twice by Carphone Warehouse, £54,000. And I said to our finance director, you've got to, got to send the money back. He said, well, we haven't got any money. Spent it. I said, <laughs> can't do that. You know, we're, we're, we're righteous. We will send the money back. And we did. And... Sometimes God challenges you to make those those. Life stories live. Decisions of integrity mm -hmm. when you know, the the world would say not to. You know, it's a bit like my story about taking on and growing the business when COVID hit. You know that's the challenge yeah. of faith. We either walk yeah. by faith uh, or or. Yeah, you know, we don't. So you had a significant meeting in 1996. You met a guy called Pat Kellard, who I became did. a mentor. Yes. Spiritual father. How important do you think it is for people to have a spiritual very, mentor? Very much, very much. And I would encourage everybody. I think uh, it's a lonely place, and particularly people in business and in their own business. And particularly if you haven't got other believers around you. It's a lonely place. And uh, Jesus sent the disciples out in twos for a reason. And I believe it's really important that you have uh, a, uh, a brother or a sister in Christ that walks with you in your business um, and prays with you, etc. And as a new believer, I think a mentor is, is really important because you don't know. You know, I, my, my knowledge of the Bible was zero back in mm -hmm. 1994. And uh, obviously you start to uh, read the words, you start to learn, you do Bible studies, all those things. But it takes time and uh, it's good to have somebody, a wiser person, been on the journey just to help you, to, to challenge you, to support you. And uh, yeah, I really encourage me to people that I think, yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to do um, many of the things or maybe none of the things, I don't know, without having that kind of mentoring, I think. So now you've moved on, you've started Parable Trust. For those listening, tell us the difference between a not-for-profit company and a non-profit company. Company. What's the difference? Right. 
So um, in the world, most companies that trade um, are for profit. They have share capital, they have shareholders, and they are driven to make more money for their shareholders. A not-for-profit company uh, is probably best described as more like a charity. We're not a charity, by the way. Uh, registration and charity rules pro would prohibit us doing what we're doing, but we're a bit like it. So we're a not-for-profit company, which means that we everything we do is for the benefit of the storehouse and the kingdom of God. So as I said, there are no, no dividends. We don't take any money out. Um, we sow that back. And that means that the business belongs to God. God is our shareholder. And that's Amen. a big difference. Not Amen. mammon, not the city, not uh, you know wealthy institutional shareholders or whatever. It's God's, it's solely God's. And I think there's a big challenge to people about the difference between stewardship and ownership. See this time again, you know, a lot of people say, it's my business, I created this, I work for it, it's mine. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm a Christian and I'll, uh, I'll give something to charity, etc. But actually it's a commitment. Are you, are you serving the Lord? Is it the Lord's business? Are you stewarding a business for God? And if somebody wanted, say a business wanted to get support from Parable Trust, how would they go about that? Contact us. Okay. Contact us. We've got a team of people. We'll, uh, we'll have a telephone conversation with anybody and everybody, particularly during this kind of difficult time. Uh, and then we'll try and provide some advice and help, meet up, uh, pray with them and see where that takes us. So go to our website, www.parabletrust.com. You can make an inquiry. So um, this business, that business, can I somebody get in touch with me? And uh, we'll, one of our team will be back to you. Is it open to any businesses or is it um, filtered? We'll speak to anybody. Okay. We will filter things. And we filter things whether we, you know, after prayer, whether we believe God wants us to, to do this and support it. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we make prayerful intercessory decisions on that basis. Amen. But, uh, yeah. You've told us about uh, many financial miracles you've seen in your life. Have you seen any other types of miracles in your life? Why well, healing obviously is, is one. Mm -hmm. um, other miracles, you haven't seen miracles in people, um, some of our staff. I think, yes, when we took over the business of Europlace, sir, I went to uh, our factory in France, never visited it before. And um, God woke me that morning, and the site manager, a uh, lovely guy who had taken us around, um, knew Pat Kellard, who had gone to glory by then and i was just sharing with him gabby french guy and i just said uh, do you know jesus he said well i was brought up uh, you know in a roman catholic background and it wasn't so so no i said do you want to know jesus and he prayed the sinner's prayer with me and he gave his life to jesus there and then and that was the first person in that factory of 80 people that ever gave their life to jesus after 30 years in the business Fantastic. And speaking of making decisions, you've made many, many in your, in your lifetime in business and other. What was the best decision you ever made in your life? To step out in faith. Come to Jesus. Be saved. See what he wants to do. Step out and serve him. Simple as that. Simple as that. Thank you so much for answering the questions. And with that, I'll just hand back to my brother, Alan. Robert, thank you so much for all you've shared tonight. It's been really wonderful listening to you, brother. Really thank you for all you've shared. Uh, yeah, and you, Pat Kellard, Mark, Michael Fenton-Jones, Gunnar mm. Olsen. Sweden. Yes. It's been, yeah, it's so great to hear about them again. But thank you so much, Robert. And I pray God will continue to bless you in the, in the work you're doing. Pray that uh, it'll open many more doors for you. So thank you so much. And if you... Want any help tonight? Then contact us on our website, lifestoriesworldwide.com, or on our number, plus 44-794-355-0287. You'll find us on lifestoriesworldwide.com, all the other information, that uh, the things that we're doing. For instance, every lunchtime, there's Life Stories TV, where there are testimonies going out every day. And if we encourage you to watch these. We, we need to increase our viewing hours and we encourage you to watch these and pass them on. Tell other people to watch these wonderful, wonderful stories. They will really encourage you. And uh, can I invite you to join us again next week at 8 o'clock UK time? Next week.
Sound has gone, Alan. Oh, that's pretty. Uh, Manchester. That's, uh... Alan, Alan, your sound's gone quiet. Could you repeat that, possibly, please? Thank you. Can I encourage you next week to join us um, for another story coming from the Philippines? Um, Christine Hales Perillo, known as Chrissy, born in Manchester, 1983, called as a mission from the Philippines, but for 10 years had anorexia. But God healed her at a meeting in Manchester one morning, and then she'd been serving in the Philippines, and she, she's going to share her story next week. So please join us and tell other people to join us 8 o'clock next week. So thank you again, Robert. Thank you, George. Thank you, Howard. Thank you all for being with us. I pray God will bless you and you'll have a wonderful week knowing that peace and joy that only Jesus can give. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. High Stories Live.